Hi all, my name is Malika and today we are having Tyler Russell. He is an experienced advisor in Web3 market strategy, assisting projects with fundraising, business development and marketing. Thank you so much for coming, Tyler. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. My first question is, how did you first become interested in crypto? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, everyone talks about the crypto light. I was living actually in China for uh, six years, so I spent 10 years there. And um, I was looking for a new opportunity in, in a different industry that I was originally in. Um, and randomly just applied to a company that was um, looking for some of those experience in marketing, business development, happened to be in Shanghai, a company called Primus. Um, they were focused at that time on uh, combating fake news by meta hashing data. Um, and then back in 2018, the market was really good as well. Um, and that was a very hot topic and something I was passionate about. Um, so really took that opportunity, not knowing like that much about blockchain or crypto per se, um, but just really fell in love, uh, one with the community and one and then also to just the technology. Thank you. Very interesting. And what exactly is Web3 and how does it differ from the previous iterations of the Internet? Yeah, so I think this is an interesting question and, you know, something that when in my first opportunity with Primus, we looked at a lot, right? Um, as we were talking, as we were creating a, a D app that was about trust and transparency, especially in user generated content. I think you have to really look back at like the very beginning of like kind of where the internet started. Um, one is like most people maybe not be familiar, but kind of the godfather founder of uh, the internet was Tim Berners-Lee back in like 1986, 87. Um, when the web first came out is, you know, very static. Um, it was very uh, rich in text, you know, and not very intuitive. Um, you know, in, in those basic days, you know, views very, very basically, right? Um, but then you fast forward to, you know, looking at Web 2 around, you know, 1999, 2000, um, you know, after the dot-com era. And then I think that's where people are most familiar with kind of what Web 2 is and their nature today, where, you know, Google and Yahoo and Vista all started to really come around from a search bar perspective. Um, the context was much more intuitive from a graphic perception, much more engaging. Um, and then, you know, I think the problem with Web 2, though, is, is we'll move on to like discussing kind of what Web 3 is, though, is that like it became very centralized in Web 2. It's really controlled by FAMGA, whether it's Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google um, and Microsoft, you know, and then I think is what excites us now about Web 3 is, you know, providing the Internet back to the users of, you know, who it really caters to and but who it should really be controlled by. And that's where I th think you start to see within, you know, blockchain technology, um, you know, user centric data that they actually own and operate um, and are able to really leverage and that we start producing content um, by the uh, by the users and for the users, you know, really trying to take back control of it. Thank you. And can you explain the key benefits of Web3 for businesses and consumers in a way that's easy to understand? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always, I think it's, you know, the difficult question when people try and ask you, can you explain blockchain or can you explain cryptocurrency? Um, I think it's, it's a question I often like to answer, but also stray away from just because it's always a long conversation. Um, but I think, you know, from the easiest perspective of just like what it can mean for a business or for a user without getting too technical um, on actually the back end of it is, you know, I think the opportunity one for businesses, as, as we discussed, is, you know, trying to com connect back to the users is for them to really understand who their users are, but allow for their users to really control their own data from one aspect. Um, right now, most is, as I mentioned previously, that data is captured by, you know, the businesses and they, they are able to use that uh, data and how they like and share it with other businesses as well. So I think a big one thing for consumers aspect is that they can start controlling their data. But from a business aspect, I think, you know, allows them to really reach out to a lot more global audience as well. As we start to discuss decentralization, that there are no more barriers uh, that pretty much exist currently in Web2, I think, for the most part. Um, but it allows us, you know, to really reach new markets um, and allows the consumers as well to, you know, reach new brands that maybe they were unfamiliar with previously. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential there. And then, you know, just like a couple of use cases, obviously, from like a supply chain management perspective on blockchain, um, creating that trust and transparency. I think they go both hand in hand, you know, one from the consumer being able to trust, you know, the brands that they're utilizing and understand where everything is coming from. And one for the brand to be able to provide that trust and transparency that wasn't there before. Um, especially as we look right now is, 
um, with immutability as well, which is like, you know, the foundation of blockchain technology that, you know, once something's put on the blockchain that it can't be tampered with, um, I think is, you know, really the highlight of what the technology provides and, you know, how businesses and consumers can really interact with it. Um, but then I think it goes much deeper when we start to talk about how consumers interact with brands and how brands interact with consumers as well. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how does Web3 impact the way companies engage with their customers and build communities? Yeah, and I, you know, I think that's a good follow-up question of kind of like what we're discussing. I think one of the big things that's been discussed within blockchain, you know, over the past couple of years, is one is DAOs, um, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, which you can kind of look at what autonomous autom realistically exists today, which is just like brand consumers are part of a community of a brand, right? Whether if it's you go to Target or your brand loyalist to Nike and you only purchase those. Those are really the people you really want to be connecting with the most as, you know, as a business. But as up to right now, the way I, I look at and explain to a lot of people when we're discussing, you know, what blockchain can provide and what DAOs can provide is, you know, immediate feedback in allowing the consumers to really help control the brand and where the brand is going in the future. Right now, I think you see a lot of that centralized within, you know, the companies themselves. They have marketing teams, they have design teams. Um, of like what should be what should be the next fashion wear what should be the next innovation within Apple, um, but I think within blockchain and within DAOs or any type of community, um, they're able to really leverage the technology by getting customer feedback quite quite quickly um, and and effectively and knowing it's transparent. Whether it's you know putting like votes uh, if it's like Nike, what next shoe they could come out with, they could put up a vote in, on the blockchain and people could register with their IDs knowing exactly who the users are and then that vote can be taken into consideration for you know their next product that they're putting out um that's just one and then i think from a business perspective what you've seen a lot that's already been done is with nfts as well or um with the metaverse as well that's really allowing people to come in and interact with the brands in a digital aspect or you know in in, a, in another world um so i think that's something that's super exciting i think there's been a little bit setback on that you know with where the markets ha has been going um, but i still think there's lots of potential for that opportunity as well what role do blockchain and cryptocurrency play in the web3 ecosystem and why are they important? Yeah, so I mean, obviously blockchain is the, the fundamental underlayer of uh, Web3. With Web3 doesn't exist without blockchain. Um, I think cryptocurrencies can exact, exist without uh, Web3, or Web3 can exist without cryptocurrency, I should say. Um, but blockchain being the underlying technology is 100% necessary for you know creating that decentralization and also creating that trust, transparency, immutability of transactions. The play I think, you know, that cryptocurrency has in it is, you know, um, really allowing cross-border transactions. Um, and I think within both of those is the ability to cut out a lot of intermediaries. Um, today, right now, between any international transaction or even, you know, domestic transaction, there are so many parties um, that are really non-essential um, within the industry from a Web2 perspective. Um, so I think when you bring blockchain and cryptocurrencies and, um, into Web3, you start talking about smart contracts, which are just, you know, automatic intermediaries that are actually just done uh, through technology and through the blockchain, which is just a, if this happens, then this is processed, you know, it's kind of um, pretty straightforward. And I think that is, you know, what's really going to revolutionize, you know, the industry going forward. In particular, I think when it comes to the internet as well, is just, you know, break down a lot more of these barriers that have been built up um, by a lot of the centralization, you know, of the economy that we live in in today's, today's world, um, where you'll start seeing, you know, a lot more of that given back to the people that actually control what they're doing and how they're interacting with businesses. And critics argue that Web3 is still in its infancy and faces scalability and usability challenges. How do you address these concerns when developing market strategies? Yeah, so I mean, obviously everything begins somewhere. Um, just like yes, we discussed in the first question, like no one really thinks back about Tim Berners-Lee creating the internet back in the 1980s and even before that. No one really ever questions where Web2 came from and talks about its evolution anymore. You know, now people talk about what's going on in TikTok or Douyin or, you know, WhatsApp, you know, or Facebook, you know, but it is early. But, you know, that's what's exciting to be to be here about. Um, and it is going to take time and, and it is frustrating. There is a lot of skepticism around it. Um, obviously, I think one of the biggest things is, is, you know, sorting out the regulation aspect, especially here in the U.S. 
Um, a lot of other countries are working on it, you know, probably are more open to it and working on it a little bit faster to try and solve these issues for one reason or another. Um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to like people, you know, worried or skeptical about it. Um, it's part of, I think, anything that comes out, you know, which is called user adoption, right? It takes time. Um, but I think that's what I enjoy about being here and, you know, and working on it, you know, and knowing that I am early and knowing, you know, that I'm in for the long run. And I think that's what a lot of people are excited about as well. I think we, a lot of us understand the potential of what, you know, what we're bringing um, and the effects that it will have in the global landscape as well. Um, especially as we start to look to emerging markets that really haven't had the opportunities that some of the Western markets have had. Um, I think is, you know, it's, we understand the pain points and I think that's what we're trying to solve. Um, so while it is early and I think you've started to actually see, I think what's one thing is you like you maybe early in the Western markets, but in the emerging markets, you know, they're actually quite advanced because they understand the benefits it provides. Um, whereas it's maybe not necessary as much in the Western market. So maybe they have that extra skepticism about it because you can always say, you know, this app already is there, you know, this, this technology is already there, but you don't know you need something until it's provided to you. I think over time is what you'll start to see is people end up utilizing blockchain technology. And I think probably many people probably do today without even knowing that they're using it. And they know in five to 10 years from now, people won't even know they're using blockchain technology. And that's kind of, so it's hard for me to argue because I think the transition will happen instantaneously where people start using it, not knowing about it. So sometimes I don't like, I don't need to explain it to you because they'll start using it before you know it. Um, I'll just be, I'm the one that was there when we started it, you know, kind of perception. Um, this guy I think is kind of where we're headed. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, can you please discuss the potential risks of investing in Web3 initiatives and how companies can mitigate them effectively? Yeah, so I can say automatically, this is not financial advice. Do, do your own research. Um, as always, you know, the disclaimer you want to give when talking about blockchain, cryptocurrencies and investments. Um, but, you know, th there is risk in anything you, you invest in. Um, and obviously, I think, you know, there's a lot of risk within cryptocurrency, there's a lot of risk within blockchain, but there's also a ton of risk in traditional finance or stocks or anything else you invest in. That's just part of investment and everyone needs to know as they go into it. Um, I think when you look at, um, you know, strategies for Web3 investment and what you're looking to, you know, really spend time on is one is understanding is there a necessary need for it right and from both a founder's perception and also the strategy they're trying to build and from a brand perception and then also to really look at you know what they're trying to build and where does their consumer actually fit into that is there actually a utility for what they're doing um and then i think the big thing is to look at is regulatory compliance as well i think anytime you're looking at investments especially within crypto um there are in any industry, there's people that are out there, there's scam, there's out there within, we call it rugging as well within crypto um, that are looking for the quick buck here and there. Um, so I think you want to look at the track record of projects as well. What else have they built and what else have they designed? What are the backgrounds of the founders from the team? Um, how long have they been building? Um, so I think, you know, there's quite a few things that are just, you know, I think very accessible um, online. And so as we also say, you know, DYOR, do your own research, uh, but also reach out to people that have been in the industry, you know, like yourself or myself. Um, you know, I think that's the one thing that's really good about this industry is within that community, whether you've been here for a year or since, you know, 2013, 14, early day Bitcoin, that people are super open to share their knowledge, whether they're an OG co-founder or, you know, a CTO, a CMO, or, you know, just, just your new person that's getting into a marketing team or a content creator. You know, either there are just so many people out there that are willing to share information and give their own perspective. Um, I think it's the best way to really look at that opportunity when you're considering whether it's investment of your own money or investment of your time, you know, however you want to look at it. I think there's a lot of different ways to talk about investment in that perspective. Totally. Yeah. And the next follow up question, how do you difference between genuine Web3 innovations and projects that might uh, be riding the hype but lack substance? Yeah. And so I think, you know, you see a lot of that in, in blockchain that, you know, every given year. And I think you see it in, in the same as well in um, traditional technology as well, that like, what is the new hot thing? What's the new hot topic right now? It's AI, it's chat GPT, um, and then everyone creating, you know, 20 or 30 new applications or, you know, or thousands of applications and raising hundreds of million dollars. Um, based on that um, and then trying to quickly flip those and sell out um, that happens as well and it happens for centuries right no matter what, what we're talking about but it's obviously happens a lot in uh, blockchain 
I think over the past, you know, since the ICO craze of 2016, 17, 18, um, that's been cut out quite a bit just because of how many did get, you know, rugged and how many people were, were, were cheated on it. Um, that, and then also a lot of those people have stuck around, really believe in the, the uh, have the belief of what blockchain can bring. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of that's been cut out for the most part. Um, and I think obviously within this year as well, you look at bear markets, it's very difficult for people to quickly flip um, products in bear markets because there's not very much investment and it's hard for people to really believe in what they're building very quickly. Um, so I think you really find your true actors um, in, in months and years like this right now. Um, but, you know, I think back to like, how do you, um, Differentiate. Obviously, I think you have to look at time frame. Um, I, I, I always, yeah, you got to go for the long run, right? I think it's like the, the like the thing is like no one really makes it overnight, and I think that's like the hard thing. And there's there's no quick sell. I don't think in like any investment strategy, right? Um, there's some outliers out there, but it doesn't happen very often. I'm not sure if I quite answered that, that correctly, but it's. <laughs> I think it, it's perfect. Yeah, it's a perfect answer. Yeah. Mm, how do you assess the long-term viability and sustainability of Web3 market strategies considering the rapidly evolving technology landscape? Yeah, so I think for like the uh, viability and, and you know sustainability of Web3 marketing strategies, um, especially with like the as you're as you're asking them about the rapid like change of technology, I think it's changed so much over time, right? Um, you know, almost any given year, there's a new platform to, you know, to build a brand upon. Um, currently right now, I think from like a Web3 marketing strategy, you know, a lot of that's just a based on trying to gain users that are already in crypto right now and in blockchain that are native to it. So, you know, a lot of those platforms could be Discord, Telegram, Twitter uh, for the most part, and some TikTok and, you know, maybe uh, Douyin as well. But to how do you, but I think is what, you know, a lot of people want to know, how do you gain that traction from a traditional Web2 user and how do you convert them? I think that's evolving, you know, as we're, I think it, there's a lot more that's happening within education right now. Um, and that can be through platforms like Medium, um, Substack, uh, YouTube as well. Um, but also I think there needs to be the need for users also to want to gain that, um, uh, gain that information as well. But I, I think, you know, as we we're talking about chat GPT, you know, there's a lot of people that utilize that, you know, to, to find a lot of answers. So I don't think it's as difficult for people to learn and understand um you know how blockchain works you know they can go ask simple questions to them or ask different props and then i think even from like an educational perspective if someone wants to understand a smart contract and how they work that you can literally just go into chat bt and ask me can you write a simple smart contract for me you know to have like a better understanding of you know what it really means so i think you know going forward as we progress there's just so much happening um, that's evolving on a week by week to month month basis that you'll quickly start to see a lot more users and uh, come into the market. I think you'll start to see a lot more developers as well. I don't think enough developers have flipped over to coding just for blockchain technology. And I think that will happen quite quickly, in which sense I think the marketing strategies will evolve as well of how you know we start to build um, marketing strategies going forward as well to attract those users based on further advancement in blockchain technology and resources in that perspective. Thank you. Yeah. And speaking about uh, YouTube, Twitter and Medium, what resources or tools do you rely on to stay informed about the crypto market? Yeah. So uh, like a conglomerate of resources, probably an overconsumption uh, on any given day. Uh, there's always a podcast. There's always a YouTube video playing um, and usually up reading articles early in the morning. Um, typical resources for me um, are definitely podcasts, um, whether it's Unchained from Laura Shin, Bankless is a great resource for Ethereum, um, but also, you know, tons of Medium accounts, Substack. I think what do you want to get into, like, really dive into and go down the proverbial rabbit hole to understand communities and what, and what blockchain companies are doing. Discord is, you know, a big one, um, but I can tell you that is a mind map for if you're not used to using it. Um, but I think it's very resourceful. Um, and I think the one thing Discord provides is a lot of different language channels, um, which I think most teams are very good at. Um, most offer at least five to 10 different languages, you know, which you can communicate with people that are part of brands and part of blockchain companies and also the team that usually have ambassadors. 
So I think that's super important. And then also Telegram as well. Uh, but I think all of those are their own mind map in themselves. Um, so tread carefully before you go down too many rabbit holes at once. Uh, feel free to reach out if you want some recommendations. Um, but yeah, I can tell you, you can read all day, every day. And the problem is once you start reading and then one thing leads to another and then you're down another rabbit hole, you know, it's kind of never ending. But I think that's what most people love about the industry. And what uh, measures do you take to ensure the security and integrity of weather projects and assets in your market strategies? Yeah, so I think, you know, when you're trying to understand like uh, Web3 projects and their marketing strategies, I think there's a couple of things that come to mind that just stick out really quick. One, I think is you can look at who the, I think if you want to skip, let's say maybe just from a consumer perspective and trying to understand a project better and maybe skip your own due diligence is probably to look at the VCs that back them. Although that could not maybe be the best statement after, you know, maybe the past year or two on some of the VCs that haven't performed as well as they could have in the due diligence. Um, but I think that, you know, that's a pretty good understanding of looking at the VCs that have backed these projects and some of the strategies they've gone through. And then look at some of the other projects that those VCs have backed as well. And do they fall in line with the current projects that's actually launching? Um, so I think that's just a really quick way to look at it. Um, then as you start to, you know, understand, let's say they pass that first test. I think it's then reading their white paper or their wiki docs to understand what the protocol is actually doing and how it's interacting and what is actually the utility for the consumers. And then I think from there, you can definitely look at the team um, perspective. And then what is the, like the long term uh, aspect of their security? You know, who have they been audited by? Which I think is also can be another red flag because not all the third party auditors have been so trustworthy in the past recently. Um, but, you know, have they been multiple auditors and what does that look like? Um, and then I think you can look at, you know, security of how they are managing their funds, whether it's in treasuries, whether it's multi-sig, is it cold wallets? Um, I think there's a lot that can be answered, I think, quite uh, quickly through these easy resources. Um, and then I think if you want to have a better understanding is actually just reaching out to the team. I think that's one thing that's unique that about blockchain is that I think you can almost reach out to any project. I don't think any project's unapproachable as where if you want to reach out to someone at like Target or um, Apple, uh, you may try and go on their LinkedIn, LinkedIn and try and find someone like a brand manager. I don't think they're going to be that like responsive, but I think within blockchain, there's a lot more ambassadors that, you know, community managers um, that are able to provide, you know, that one on one um, relationship, which I think is super unique about the industry. So I think that would be another approach to have a really deep dive understanding and really be speaking with someone that's also passionate to understand why they're as passionate as you are maybe about the project. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much, Taylor. How do you handle? Yeah, no problem. How do you handle criticisms that Web3 market strategists might prioritize short-term profits over the long-term health of the technology and community? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone wants to make a quick buck. I mean, that's just a nature of a human being. I think, and at, and at any given time, um, we we all look the we all look for a way to do it. I think for the most part, um, you know, I think. And like the short term strategy, if it's too easy, I think um, it's probably too good to be true. Um, and that has been a fallacy within the industry as of most recently, whether it's Terra um, and, and many other projects um, that didn't work out well. Um, I my just honest opinion it would probably be just to stay away from them. But um, I think, you know, the negative consequences of that have been quite difficult over the past couple couple of months and years. Um, but I think you have to understand that people are in it for the long haul or are the ones to really, you know, stand behind um, and really to put the time and effort in to help support them. Um, and that those are the ones that are probably more the true actors, you know, than the ones that are going for the quick dollar. I think it's, I just think there is no quick dollar in today's ecosystem, especially in a bear market for sure. Um, but, you know, I think you must be careful coming into next year around the halving or the next bull market um, when everyone thinks there'll be a lot of money flowing in and there probably will be into the industry um, to, you know, even more walk or tread carefully at that point as well. I mean, it's one you really need to be careful. And when will the market go up? Mm, good question. Uh, having in April of next year for Bitcoin, which is always a tall tale sign. Um, if it follows the market trends of the past, you know, uh, 10 to uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, I think overall, the regulatory in the U.S. is a big uh, de determinant right now, detriment to 
where the market sits. Um, obviously, everyone's talking a lot if ETFs can get approved. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot behind it. It is on. I think it's on a breaking point. Um, I'm looking towards the end of next year, but it's not financial advice. Um, but um, the longer we wait, I think the stronger the community becomes. I think you know. You know, in any bear market, people build, and you know the people that stick around are, are the ones that are really true and passionate about it. Um, and I think the ones that maybe come in, you know, during the bull market, while it's very much easier, and that doesn't mean that anything's wrong with it. Um, you know, maybe maybe not the best actors, or you know, are just looking for that quick buck as you know the last question. Um, but the ones that stand stand tall through the time, um, hopefully, will be rewarded on the next bull run, whether it's end of next year or two years from now. Hope it's not that far away, but yeah. Yeah, hope so. And uh, Taylor, what excites you most about the future of Web three market strategy and its potential impact? And in general, what excites you most about the future of Web three? Yeah, I'm. And I think this is the reason why I've stayed in the industry through every bear market and every bull run is I'm excited most, you know, about the communities. And I think that's where Web3 really comes in. Um, the strategies come in. Um, the communities, whether it's, you know, the communities that are excited about projects or the communities that are the teams or the communities that are um, within the different layer ones or twos, whether it's Ethereum, Optimism, Arbitrum, you know, whether it's a community in Binance or Woo Exchange, you know, I think all these communities, you know, are just super exciting. Um, and it's the it's the goal that we all have is to bring this technology to the masses, whether those people believe in it or not. Um, I think is what we are is what we're all super excited about and super passionate about. Um, and then we look and what we look forward to, like each new person you convert, like every single time is like even if it's just one is a small conversation is like a win. Now, I don't think it's just a win personally, but I think it's a win for like all of us. And I think that's the way I look at it. You know that you know just. Not, I don't want to say spreading the gospel, but you know that's kind of you know our belief of you know where we think the you know the technology is taking to it. And then I think from a marketing strategy, as we're discussing, you know, as the technology evolves, just you know, all new ways of connecting with people. You know, metaverses are one thing, uh, but you know, tomorrow could be a whole nother you know no other play, um, just because things do change so fast. Um, and the scalability is really increasing um, very quickly. Um, so I think a lot of barriers are being broken any given day, even if we're just talking about Ethereum moving over, um, you know, and, and how that all changed. And, you know, ZK proofs, you know, are just becoming crazy. And I think that'll be super important from, uh, from a consumer perspective and bring a whole new perspective really to Web3. But I think that's a whole nother probably, uh, you know, call. Uh, but yeah, I just think there's so many small things that will really onboard a lot of users. And I think that's what's super exciting that there's so many different ways that the technology will touch us in our everyday lives, um, I think is what motivates, you know, a lot of people about new strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me today. Likewise.